Adopt the posture of someone who is passionate. Explore what it would mean to be passionate about this. If no one's ever been passionate about it in the history of the world, then don't do that. But there are people who are passionate about emptying septic tanks. Right? How efficient can they be? How clean can they be? How much can they explore on other topics in their head while their body's doing something else? But what would it feel like to be the best in the world at this, at least for a little bit? And the Reverend Martin Luther King said so many brilliant things, but one of the things he said is, not everyone's gonna be able to you know, go do that dunk a basketball at the NBA Finals. Maybe you're a street sweeper, but if you're a street sweeper, be the best street sweeper. Fold your lot to be a street sweeper. Sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Leontine Price sings before the Metro Metropolitan Opera. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all the host of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. The myth now, which every school kid knows, is Icarus and his dad Daedalus are on the island. Um, they're stranded there. They make wings and they put them on their back, holding them along with wax, and they fly away. But before they fly away, Daedalus says to Icarus, don't fly too high. Don't get arrogant, don't get uppity. If you fly too high, the wax will melt and you'll perish. And Icarus flies too high and he dies. And so the lesson is obvious. Listen to your dad, listen to the boss, do what you're told, fit in, don't get arrogant. But before the industrial age, the story also said, my son, do not fly too low because if you fly too low, the mist will get in the feathers and it will weigh you down and you will perish. They took that part out because they wanted people to fly too low. They wanted people to settle. And so the argument I'm making is we have these magnificent tools that we've built at great cost to the environment and to other people. And we are wasting them, wasting them doing stupid stuff like tweeting when we could be building something important, but we are flying too low. understand that it is extremely unlikely that you are right. It is very likely that you are interesting, but how can you be right about the future that isn't here yet? That what changes is about inventing a new kind of future. That if the Wright brothers were still around and they didn't compromise, no one would be flying anywhere because you can't fly in a Wright brothers plane. It only goes a couple hundred yards. They compromised with nature, they compromised with engineers, they compromised, et cetera, et cetera, to get to a thing that worked. So there is a core change we seek to make, but we can't make that change without compromising with reality when it arises. That doesn't mean we're here to please everybody. If some people wanna take us somewhere and others don't, we can just work with the people who wanna go where we wanna go. But Reality demands that we recognize it. Reality says, I don't care how much you want something. It violates the laws of thermodynamics you can't have. All change involves tension. It's the tension of this might not work, the tension of what will other people say, the tension of this might work and then what will happen. So if I want to shoot a rubber band across the room, I pull it backwards before I let it go. If there is no tension, it doesn't go anywhere. We create tension when we establish the conditions for learning. We can't shy away from it, we have to see it. It's on there, right there on the table. Tension is going to be created. How will people deal with that tension? What about our peers, affiliation? Who's to our left and who's to our right? What are we all doing? People like us do things like this, that you are defined by how your friends see the world because you have chosen them to be your friends. You're in that circle. So if you're in a group of seven people and they're all angling to get into medical school, you are more likely to push yourself because you see the people you want to be in sync with pushing themselves. So when we create these conditions, 
It's not about obedience or compliance. It's about what's it like around here when we're in a learning culture. It's easier to be frustrated than it is to shift the circle of people that you're counting on. And if you don't want to be frustrated, start by shifting the circle of people. Tell me what happens after that. Tell me what happens when you start a mastermind group or a circle of people that you have to check in with just for five minutes every day online. For 10,000 years, human beings were only in groups of 150. That Dunbar's number is a real thing. That we are uncomfortable if there's more than 150 people in our Rolodex. There's only 150 people that match our brain's ability to really connect with. Well, that tribe has a lot of influence on us. You don't want to get kicked out of it, because in the old days, if you got kicked out of the village, the tiger would eat you. There's a lot of pressure to fit into that circle. But now, we have this freedom to either join a different circle, or even better, start one. And the idea of small world leadership is so powerful. Every big idea in our culture, every single one, started as a small group of people, 20, 30, 50 people, who connected with each other, amplified it, and took it to the next level. And if, that, if, if that's giving them solace and satisfaction and connection, it's worth the bread. It's so easy to get hung up on self-belief because it seems unattainable and essential and it's needed. If you're a lifeguard and there's a dock with six lifeguards on it and someone, God forbid, starts struggling in the water, drowning right in front of you, it would be accurate to say that you are not the best lifeguard in the world, maybe not even the best lifeguard on the dock, that you didn't do the best at your bronze medallion and someone could do a better job than you. But you are the one who's standing right in front of that person. And if you jump in the water, you will save that person's life. That is a generous thing for you to do. I would like to think that most people in that situation would jump in the water. Well, this instinct to be a lifeguard is exactly what we're talking about when it comes to leadership. There are lonely people. There are uninformed people. There are people who need to be activated. There are people who want to be taught. You are standing right here on the dock. You are the single best person to do this generous act. I don't care whether you believe in yourself or not. What I care about is that you can do something generous right here and right now. Go do that. And once you do it, now you will know that you can do it, so you can do it again. When we're gonna do something creative, something generous, something powerful, that voice shows up and says, better not. You can't make it go away. You can't make imposter syndrome go away. What you can do is dance with it. You can say, thank you. You know, if you wanna run the marathon, you can go get a coach. But you can't say to the coach, I would like to be able to run a marathon without getting tired. Because what comes with carrying a 220 pound stone is you get tired, that is the point. So the difference between someone who finishes the marathon and someone who stops at mile 20 is simple. The person who stops at mile 20 didn't know what to do with the tired. And the person who finishes did. You can't make the tired go away, but you can figure out what to do with it. And the same thing is true with our fear when it comes to leadership, when it comes to contribution. The fear's not gonna go away, but you can say thank you, put it in a useful place. I have all these tools in front of me. Yeah, it's not, you know, there's too much social injustice and I shouldn't have to work two shifts and, and I'm treated with disrespect. But I still have an hour a day with my smartphone. Am I spending the hour a day with my smartphone watching other people have an argument? Am I spending that hour sharing my poetry? Am I spending that hour building something? Because if you can find something to be passionate about with a community of people, doors will begin to open. That doesn't mean you're gonna get some fancy executive high paid job, but doors in your soul will begin to open because you've discovered it's not up to the outside world for you to light up. 
you can light up even for five minutes a day by connecting with someone who feels alone, by saying something that needs to be said. And then when we get in it, we're more likely to encounter a flow state. And it's a flow state that makes us get to the next level, right? And when we feel like we are playing, we feel more alive. So what would you need to do to find a moment in your day where you could play? Maybe it's not at your day job, maybe it is, but where is the, the chance to play at some level? Because you don't get today over again. I asked 10,000 people around the world in 90 countries, tell me about the best job you ever had. And I gave them 14 choices about what it made it the best job they ever had. And I included among the 14 choices things that bosses would pick, like I got paid a lot, uh, I got to tell other people what to do, et cetera. But I then listed things that almost every single person picked, almost every single person, for the best job they ever had in their whole life. I accomplished more than I thought I could. I was surrounded by people who encouraged me to do even more, right? And I did something that was difficult. When we have those three things in a job, we look forward to doing it again tomorrow. And different people need different things. Some people want to be completely alone on a desert island, but other people really benefit from having two or three people standing to their left and to their right. That the, the Hong Kong Cavaliers, the group of people, the 14 of us who are on this journey together, this cadre, this tribe, that gets me through the hard days. Because some days I'm gonna help push them forward, some days they're gonna help push me forward. And when we think about how lonely seven billion people on Earth, there's almost no one who says, I'm fully connected. I don't need any more encouragement. I don't need any more people who are rooting for me. I'm good. Very few people could say that. So be one of those people, and they will then engage you in your circle and their circle, and it keeps becoming iterative. This is possible. Significance is real to be in a place where we are respected, treated with dignity, where we make a change happen that we're proud of. You might even get paid for that work, but that, I think, is the purpose of our days. It makes a lot more sense to become passionate about what you do, as opposed to insisting that you do what you're passionate about. So there are people who are passionate about customer service who work in a coffee shop. There are people who are passionate about um, helping kids who are Montessori teachers but they became passionate after the gig showed up. So we are way more flexible than we imagine. And I don't think you're born with one thing and only one thing that you can be passionate about. I think we can choose it. Here we go. It's out there, to, it, it's on its own now. For me, it's what does it look like to have a puzzle, a problem, a page that's not finished, a, project that doesn't quite work, the person in front of me who can go to the next level. Can I nudge this in a way that solves that problem? That's what I do every single day. And it's what I do if I'm training my puppy, and it's what I do if I'm standing at the checkout trying to figure out why there's such a long line and how they could fix it. All knowledge is self-knowledge in that if it's in a book, you don't know it yet. You know it once you do it. We become what we do. So what holds us back from doing it? I'm terrible at basketball. I could probably get better at basketball. I will not get better at basketball by reading about it or watching YouTube videos. I will only get better at basketball by shooting in a way that makes me realize I can shoot better than I used to, which means confronting incompetence which means being willing to acknowledge that yesterday I'm not as good as I am today. People don't want to let go of that feeling, so they hold on to, I'm good, I don't have to get better. But if we can give people the foundation for them to feel like they can lean forward a little bit, then they lean forward, and when they lean forward, their posture changes, and then they experience something differently, and then they learn, because they did something. Every single person who has been fortunate enough to be able to learn to walk has learned to walk by walking poorly. They take a step, they fall down. They take a step, they fall down. They take two steps, they fall down. They don't give up on walking at that point. They toddle their way through it. 
and your son is doing the same thing now with basketball and with reading and with everything else. That learning is about creating the conditions for people to teach themselves, not lecturing people on something that's in a book. We are born with fear. We're born with fear for a really good reason. You don't evolve as a successful species if you're not filled with fear. Evolution doesn't like change, external change, because it's risky. The frog, the wolf, they want everything tomorrow to be just like yesterday. No threats. We have that too, for good reason. That's one reason, for example, why many people don't like cilantro because if you don't eat cilantro until you're a teenager, it tastes like soap and it's horrible because we evolved to not like strong flavors we're not used to because they might be poison. Fear is real. The difference is fear of saber-toothed tigers, fear of lightning, fear of drowning is real for a good reason. Fear of someone not liking the talk you're giving, fear of someone not wanting to watch your video is not useful because no one is going to ever make something that everyone is going to like. That what we have to do is have the empathy to be able to say to the non-believers, it's not for you. To be able to say to the people who say it's not very good, I didn't make it for you. The people who love it, if there aren't any of those people, we didn't make a good thing. But if there are people who love it, that's who it's for. So we have to reserve the fear for where it belongs. I'm talking about the right fear for the right reason, and when it shows up for the wrong reason, it's pretending that it's warning us, but it's not, we're just hiding. So imposter syndrome is real. The sense that you feel like you're an imposter when you're doing something new, because you are an imposter. The only way to do important work is to do work you haven't done before. So you have no proof that you can do it. The proof will come from doing it. So I'm not talking about arrogance, and I'm not talking about showing up insisting that you are always right. I'm saying, if you see someone drowning, you gotta jump in the water and try to save them. It's not a leap, it's a step. No one's asking you to go give a talk on the main stage at Davos. That's not what's on offer. What's on offer is, can you send a constructive email to one person? Can you make a three-minute tutorial on video with your camera and share it with four of your customers who are stuck. Today's video is sponsored by Huel and they've just sent me the new Black Edition personalized box, which I'm super excited about. And it says to Jordan, ready for the ultimate meal in a bottle. Get excited to try our most anticipated product yet, introducing the new Huel Black Edition ready to drink. Black Edition Huel is a higher protein content version of their drinks, and they're absolutely amazing. I drink the powdered Black Edition all the time, and I also drink their ready-to-drinks. So the fact they've combined these two into one is absolutely unbelievable. It has 35 grams of protein, 26 vitamins and minerals, and if I know Huel, it's gonna taste great. I don't wanna say this, but that's, Maybe better tasting than the original vanilla. That's delicious. I'm gonna do two. Screw it, Neve's jealous right now behind the camera. Mmm. Whoa. That's like, tastes like a chocolate brownie. That's incredible. 35 grams of protein, all 26 essential vitamins and minerals, seven grams of dietary fiber, slow-release carbs, omega-3 and 6. Honestly, this stuff is incredible. But the reason that Huel Black Edition Ready to Drink is so good, if you're training, if you're busy, if you're on the go, this has everything that the standard Huel has, but more protein. It has a higher protein content. And for me, when I'm trying to build muscle out here, especially as a plant-based athlete, this stuff is my go-to. And I want to say, this is by far the best taste in Huel. I'm not kidding. This is the best one. Thank you to Huel. If you want to find out more, Go to the link in the description. Make these a part of your life, honestly, they're incredible.